everyone, so I think it's time to start. I wish you a warm welcome here at this workshop at the DevOps gathering in Bochum. I'm very glad to be here. My name is Rainer Strobeck. I come from a beautiful town in Austria, which is called Linz. And well, what I do for a living is Azure and Cloud. Uh, I have founded my latest company um, 10 years ago and we found it with the sole purpose to build software as a solution, software as a service solutions in the Azure cloud. So I've been using Azure for quite a long time, for approximately 10 years, and our whole company is built around services that we build and run in the Azure cloud. So today the topic is container as a service in the Azure cloud. So let me start by uh, telling you what you can't expect from this workshop and then we go on and I tell you what you can expect from this workshop. What you can't expect from this workshop is a basic introduction into Docker, Kubernetes and things like that. That's not the topic of this talk. I assume you have at least basic knowledge about container technologies, especially Docker. First, second, this is not a talk about infrastructure as a service. Of course, you can run your virtual machines, your virtual networks, your storages and all the things you need to run your own Docker infrastructure in Azure based on infrastructure as a service. You can do that manually through the portal, you can automate that with PowerShell, with Bash and so on, but this is not what this talk is all about. In this talk, in this session, in this workshop here, I would like to focus on the capabilities of Azure concerning platform as a service and serverless offerings. What do I mean with that? Platform as a service means that you get a ready-made platform from Azure. You don't see the virtual machines anymore. Well, that's not 100% technically correct what I'm saying here. Maybe you see the virtual machines, but you shouldn't touch them. So you should not care about the operating system, about the network infrastructure, nothing like that. You ask for a certain platform or a service, in our case something related to Docker, but there are other services too, like databases, web servers and so on, and the platform provides it as a ready-made service. You don't patch it, you don't upgrade it, you merely do not maintain it. The only thing that you have to do is you have to scale it. So it's, it's not a service where you can't forget about service at all, it's a service where you don't care about maintaining that. The next evolution from platform as a service would be serverless. And we are going to take a look at serverless container services in Azure 2. What does serverless mean? Serverless, serverless does of course not mean that there are no servers anymore. That doesn't work. Of course there are servers. But the point is you don't have to care about them. It's just like electricity. While platform as a service is a little bit like a hotel. You are reserving a certain room and if you use it, it's fine. If you don't use it, you have to pay for it. A serverless means it's just like electricity. You don't care about the size and the amount of space you want to have. You just use it and at the end of the month, you can charge a certain amount of money depending on the use of your service. You do not have to reserve anything, anything up front. You get paid by the processor milliseconds, by the CPU milliseconds, by the, by the storage, by the RAM or disk or whatever. That's the difference between platform as a service and service. And these two topics we want to focus on in the next three hours that we have. How do I want to, um, how do, I want to do that? How do I want to go through with this workshop? Well, I don't have any slides. We will not take a look at slides at all. What I can give you as, the, uh, as some material that you can take home, first, the scripts. All the scripts that I show you, you can get them, they are on GitHub, and you can download them and you can try it at home. Second thing, I'm currently recording this session and I'm going to start recording of my, um, of my video screen too. So I can give you, if the technology works, a complete recording of this workshop and I will put it on YouTube and if you want you can watch it again. Uh, so follow me on Twitter, Facebook or wherever you find me, LinkedIn, Zing, I'm nearly everywhere. So uh, and you will see it, you will see it there. You will find my YouTube channel and in the YouTube YouTube channel you will you'll also find a lot of other um, a lot of other materials. So let's start the screen recording. before we go into the first technical levels. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Couple of 
housekeeping things. Housekeeping things, how I work here, what I did, what I prepared for this session. I always get the feedback from people attending my sessions or workshops. They say, hey Rainer, tell us which tools you use, what's the setup in which you are working, because it's important for us to understand that in order to follow along the samples. The development environment, or let's say the scripting environment that I will use throughout this workshop is Visual Studio Code. If you're not familiar with this tool, it's a free editor um, based on Electron. So essentially you're working with a website inside a little application. Uh, it's free, it's open source, it runs on all platforms. And the nice thing is that the Visual Studio Code tool, oh, I have to zoom out a little bit, um, has a nice plugin. Um, you have the Azure CLI tools and you can install them and that makes it super simple to automate Azure using the Azure CLI. So the cross-platform automation tool from Azure. This is essentially what I'm going to use throughout this, uh, this demonstration. Additionally, if you take a look here, Visual Studio Code has also nice plugins for Docker and Kubernetes. So if you want to uh, manage Docker and Kubernetes directly from your scripting environment, that's a nice thing. I'm not going to use PowerShell, but of course there is a nice PowerShell integration too in Visual Studio Code. The second thing that I did in order to prepare this workshop is I set up a virtual machine in the Azure Cloud. Uh, I will show you that virtual machine. It lives here in the resource group DevOps Gathering Shell. Uh, it's not relevant for, for the content of the demos. But you know, we are here in a public place and the internet is sometimes not as strong as I would like it to be. And therefore, what I did is I SSH'd into this virtual machine. It's a plain Ubuntu, nothing special. And essentially, my Visual Studio code, as you can see it here, has a terminal down there. And this terminal is now connected to the virtual machine in Azure. So the only bandwidth that I really need is the bandwidth for SSHing my commands into the cloud. And from there on, I have a pretty big and solid internet connection. So this is the reason why for this workshop I'm going to use a VM in the cloud. It's not relevant for the content of my demos, but it's relevant in order to save bandwidth and in order to be faster with the deployment. Okay? What's this running? Pardon? What's this fastest running? Mm -hmm. uh, which, which host? The host in the cloud? You message to. Uh, Ubuntu 18 something. Yeah, Ubuntu 18. But it doesn't matter. Anyways, uh, what I have installed on this machine is that I have installed, of course, Docker, uh, the Docker tools, uh, Kubecuddle tools, uh, Kube, uh, Kubernetes tools, um, and the Azure CLI, of course. And, and I think it shouldn't be a problem to install. Good. So that was the housekeeping stuff so that you know what I'm, what I'm doing. So before I start, immediately with the first demos and with the first topics, let me ask you Essentially, one or two questions. Who of you would say he or she, no, he, um, <laughs> is, um, is pretty well familiar with Docker? Uh. Who would say basic understanding of Docker? Okay. Who would say pretty well familiar with Kubernetes? Familiar with Kubernetes a little bit, know what it does? Okay. Who would say pretty well familiar with Azure? Okay. Who would say a uh, little bit familiar with Azure? Who would say never touched Azure before? Good. So I know what uh, I know what to, to cover. Good. That's good. That's good. So. Uh, I will quickly, whenever we touch the Azure space, if we have more than half of the room who have never really worked with Azure before, uh, whenever I use some Azure terminology or basic constructs, I will quickly describe them, but please, um, please bear with me, I cannot go into all the details, this is not an introductory talk about Azure, so if you can follow along because you are missing some, some context information, what I'm talking about, please interrupt me and ask me questions, okay? Good. So, the first thing that I have to do in Azure, if I want to do some scripting, and that's very important because, hey, we are here at a DevOps conference, and what, we, what do we do as DevOps engineers? 
We don't click around in portals, we script, right? And therefore, I do everything in script. So if I do that, first I have to log in, um, and I will do that with the AZ login. And there you see um, an important concept for those of you who have not worked with Azure before. If you are on a Linux machine, when you do not have any UI, you will get such a device login code, then you can go to microsoft.com slash device login. There, you have to paste in the code and you have to sign in with your account to Azure. I will do that. And now, through a back channel, my bash environment is talking to somewhere in the cloud and I signed in somewhere in the cloud and they bring it together and in a few seconds, I'm logged in. So now my session at the Ubuntu host is now signed in with my credentials and all the things that I'm now going to do, I do them with my account. This, this kind of authentication for DevOps scripting is really important because you don't want to have some, some magic client IDs and secrets laying around. You want to use multi-factor authentication, Azure Active Directory integration and so on and this is a very important construct. I will talk a lot about, about uh, security in terms of Azure throughout this workshop. So now we are logged in and I, for my side, have a bunch of so-called subscriptions. For those of you who are not that familiar with Azure, in Azure you have so-called tenants, which are essentially Azure Active Directory. And inside of a tenant you can have multiple subscriptions. Okay? A subscription is, um, let's say, a, a bucket where you can throw a lot of resources in it. Will you and your companies have just one subscription? Could be, if you are a smaller or medium-sized company, could be that you have only one subscription. But you can also have 10 or 20 or 100, it really depends on the size and on your, uh, on your needs. And what I currently did is I have uh, selected a certain subscription. Uh, by the way, I have at the beginning of my script a lot of variables, you see, so I don't have to type so much. So if I say dollar subscription here, it is essentially the name of the subscription you find somewhere above in this variable section. So that's it. Now I'm connected with my shell, uh, with essentially this here. This is my environment. This is my subscription. Um, and from now on, we are going to work in this area. And the first thing that we always have to do before we do anything in Azure is we have to create so-called resource groups. Now, what are resource groups? Resource groups are a structure inside of your subscription. And you can create as many resource groups as you want. They are free. And based on resource groups, you can define so-called access permissions. RBAC, resource access based, resource based access control. That's, that's the correct one, RBACs. So what you do is you are creating resource groups, put your resources in these resource groups and then you can define who of your DevOps team is allowed to do what in which resource group. You can compare that in a real data center with maybe a rack that is locked and only certain people have a key for this rack and then you have another rack where other people have the keys to unlock the rack in order to do something with the machines and that's exactly the same but of course in resource groups you can do much more um, much more in terms of resource based access control uh, on, a very, on a much finer level so I'm not going to touch this one but this is the reason why you, you have these resource groups so what I could essentially do I could create a resource group and then give anybody of you access to this resource group read only, contributor rights, it depends on what you want to do Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create a resource group and this resource group will have the name DevOps Gathering. Okay, I can do that and I do that here with this Azure CLI stuff. For, for those of you who are not that familiar with Azure already, uh, this AZ is the Azure CLI. It runs on Windows, Linux and Mac. You can use it to automate nearly everything that you can do in Azure. Alternative would be PowerShell. I decided to not go for PowerShell in this, in this, this workshop because maybe I, I see a bunch of, of apples here and maybe you are doing Linux stuff and so on. The Azure CLI works everywhere. So this is a really nice thing to do. Does the Azure CLI support everything in terms of containers? Container related work in Azure? No, it doesn't. Um, 
The only thing that really supports every, every, everything is the REST API on the very bottom when you interact with Azure. With Azure. And then the, the Azure teams, they are building APIs on top of it. So the first thing for very new features is always the REST API. Then comes to so the support for ARM templates, then you get the, the PowerShell stuff, and then the Azure CLI stuff. So there are a few things, especially for preview features and very new features, that you might not be able to do with the Azure CLI. But they are very limited and typically in practice not a big problem. Good. Um, yeah, of course, you can not only create things, you can also query if the things exist, but I think you get it from the context, so I will not talk a lot about it. So in my case, I'm going to create um, a resource group. Let me show you how this works. Let me make that a little bit larger. Uh, the nice thing is if you have the Visual Studio tool for Azure CLI installed, is you can just mark a few uh, statements up there, press Control and on my German keyboard it's a uh, umlaut a. Uh, on English keyboards I'm pretty sure you will find it out. Uh, it's F1 and run in terminal. This is the command. See, this is the this is the command. If you do that, the, the command will be executed down here, and you will always get the result in form of, of JSON. And you can parse this JSON and automate your scripts in any way you like. So if we take a look, the result should be doo -doo 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 -doo. hopefully internet will be stable because without internet the whole workshop doesn't make any sense. Oh. Mm -hmm. Did I say without internet the whole workshop doesn't make any sense? <laughs> It's not very stable. That's not good. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Connection error. I love that. <laughs> Typically, I have my phone as a backup plan, but unfortunately, I don't know why, inside of this building, I only have edge connection. So, no way of connecting to my phone and using it as a fallback. I'm, I'm very sorry, this is out of my control. Um, and I hope, I hope it will get up again. Huh? Looks better? Looks better? Yeah, crossing fingers. Good. DevOps gathering, here it is, it's empty, and here you see we could now go on and do some access control stuff and so on, but this is basic Azure, we are not going to talk about that. I'm going to create a second resource group here, uh, and the reason for that is already important if you want to work with containers in Azure. Uh, we are going to use a platform as a service offering for containers, which is called App Service. You know, I am, if we are talking DevOps, I am more the DevOps guy. So I'm doing 80% Dev work. I love writing code, I love C Sharp, I love Node.js, TypeScript, and all this stuff. I love diving into this stuff. Uh, and I do a little bit of Ops work. Ops means I have no idea about infrastructure as a service. I can only use things if they are presented as platform as a service. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I think you get the point. Uh, and app services is really the heaven for web developers. It doesn't matter whether you build web apps or web APIs or WebSocket stuff, but app services is, is absolutely great when it comes to web development. That's exactly what you want to go. And app services supports containers. You're going to see live some containers running app services in a platform as a service way. Um, the thing is, if you want to run Windows app services and Linux app services, there is currently a restriction. You cannot run app services for Linux and app services for, li for Windows in a single resource group. So you have to create two separate resource groups in order to run Windows containers and app services and Linux containers and app services. That's a limitation. It's a technical limitation. It is like it is. I'm just the messenger. We can't change it. So, this is the reason why I created two resource groups here. And if we take a look, we now should have, here it is, um, DevOps Gathering and DevOps Gathering Linux. And I'm going to use the first one for Windows app services and the second one for Linux app services. Generally, in this workshop, I'm primarily focusing on the Linux stuff. So, you will not see a lot of Windows presentations because 
to be fair, what is the cloud made of? A bunch of Linux servers, that's essentially it, and that's true for Azure too. So, yes, of course, Windows is supported. I'm going to tell you a lot about Windows support, but I'm not going to focus a lot on demos here. If you have any questions, just, uh, just stop. Good. Now, the first big topic that we are going to spend quite a lot of time on is Azure Container Registry. What is Azure Container Registry? It's the first serverless service that is super interesting when it comes to working with containers. Does it make sense to just use Azure Container Registry and don't care about the rest of Azure? Of course. If you just want to run a highly available serverless container registry in the cloud, which is secured by your Active Directory, you could use Azure Container Registry. It could be your enterprise container registry without having to worry uh, running your own container registry. So what, what can this container registry do? First, well, it's a registry. You could push images there, nothing special, it just works. It is not a new implementation of Microsoft. It is the original open source Docker registry code and Microsoft is just adding the, the operation stuff as a serverless service on top of it. So you are not buying software from Microsoft, you are buying the operations piece and you are buying the business model essentially, okay? The pricing model if you want. So you can store your images there, that's the first thing. The second thing is you can secure these images with Azure Active Directory integration. And if you have Azure Active Directory integration and you have your Azure Active Directory synchronized with your Active Directory, you, mean, you immediately have single sign-on into your container registry from your Active Directory. If you don't federate your Active Directory with Azure Active Directory, well you, then you can just use Azure Active Directory standalone and you can create users and service principles and so on inside of Azure Active Directory and I'm going to show you how this works. That's the first, that's the second feature. The third feature, and I personally find this feature super interesting, especially in the DevOps context, is that the Azure Container Registry is capable of building images in the cloud. So you do not need your own Docker host to build Docker images. You just take your Docker file plus all files that are necessary in reference from the Docker file, and instead of Docker build, you say, hey Azure CLI, build this stuff. And what then happens, it takes the files, uploads them to the Azure Container Registry, and you are paying the CPU and memory that this thing uses in order to build your images. And you do not have to provide any kind of Docker host to do that. You don't upgrade the server, you don't maintain the server, you don't need Kubernetes for that, nothing like that. It is purely serverless. You pay exactly for the milliseconds that you use on the CPU. And if you, I don't know, at the end of the week, during a night, you, you do a lot of updates of your, of your Docker images and you need a lot of compute power. That's exactly the way to go. You don't have to care for it. You don't have to scale it. You don't have to tell the system, give me a that much machine or five machines. Just fire your Azure Docker build statements and they will care for scheduling all this stuff. You will always get a free, uh, 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 you will always get a fresh engine, a fresh um, environment where this stuff is built. There is nothing cached. It will be immediately recycled after your images is built, has been built. So this is exactly what a server service is all about. I'm going to show you how this works. And additionally, this build engine in the Azure Container Registry is also pretty smart in monitoring dependencies between your images. So if your image depends on a base image, and this base image depends on another base image, and that this base image is updated, you can tell the Azure Container Registry to rebuild all the depending images based on so-called webhooks. So you can easily plug into this infrastructure and get notified or let the system build the images automatically if you want. And this does not only work for base images which are in an Azure Container Registry, it works with any base image that lives out in an internet accessible container registry. So if a base image in the Docker Hub changes, it can also update your images in, in the Azure Container Registry. That's especially important for, for many enterprises to have such a feature. And of course, with the Webhook technology and with so-called Event Grid, you can also plug in your own workflows in this whole automation stuff. So what you can essentially do is you can say, hey, Azure Container Registry, if somebody pushes a new image onto the Azure Container Registry, 
please inform me, me being an application, and then I can do any kind of workflow that I want. I can, for instance, build a small serverless function that does some things, maybe deploy a web application to any kind of on-premise server from the Azure Container Registry, or I can build a workflow notifying some managers that something has changed and they have to do some, I don't know, some, some testing or whatever it could be. It depends on your needs. Okay? This is, in summary, what Azure Container Registry can do for you. So, it's quite a lot and it's kind of the basic, the fundamental of all the other services that sit on top of it because in real world, typically, uh, services like App Services, Azure Container Instances or AKS, Kubernetes, they are fetching their images from Azure Container Registry. One last feature I would like to point out for those of you who work in larger worldwide acting enterprises. Azure Container Registry can replicate in any Azure data center in the world, except China, that does not work because they have to run their own data center and that has legal reasons, but all the other data centers, and there are a lot of them, Microsoft can replicate your images through the Microsoft network and you do not have to do the replication. So this is another very big thing if you have to run a web application based on Docker images around the globe, you can Azure, you can the container registry, let the images replicate all across the globe and then you always can be sure that pulling down the images onto your web farms, for instance, is pretty fast because the container is, sorry, the image is already side by side sitting in the same data center. Okay? The last feature is only available in the premium edition of the Azure Container Registry. By the way, premium, I know exactly what's going through your mind because that's always the same, same thing. Sounds great, but what does it cost? Let's get this out of our way so we can focus uh, on, the, on the functionality. Uh, if you go to Azure Microsoft.com uh, pricing, you can say container and then you find a lot of interesting things. For instance, here, container registry, and here you see what this stuff costs. The basic option, which is primarily for development purposes, costs a base price of 14 euros cent. The standard, which is good for small to medium implementations, costs 50 cent per day. And the premium costs 1.4 euro per day. And you see 10, 100 and 500 gigabyte storage. You have so-called webhooks. Webhooks means that you get informed whenever something changes, so you can trigger your own workflows. And geo-replication. You see, this costs extra. If you want to buy additional storage, it's the same for all three um, price plans and it costs, I don't know how many fractions of a cent per day. Um, yeah, and this is the price for Western Europe. If you want to do container build, um, this is the price per CPU second. Uh, I can't tell you how many zeros this are. You, you can do the math of your own. So, typically, it's a, it's a pretty good price point because you don't have to care for it and it's essentially yeah, nearly no ops. So yeah, it's typically uh, an easy sell uh, if you think about it because it's a low hanging fruit. So let's get started with it and let's do something with it. The first thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to create an Azure Container Registry. Let's do that. So let's run it. Okay. So I zoom in a little bit and we take a look. You see, AZ, ACR, create, resource group, some name, some SKU. The SKU here is basic, standard, or premium. This is essentially what you say here. And then you have an option which says admin enabled and we have to talk about that because that is security relevant. The Azure Container Registry has multiple different options for authentication. If any kind of application would like to either push or pull images to or from the Azure Container Registry, it has to somehow authenticate. And this can be done through an account name and key. That's a single account name plus two account secrets for rollover purposes. That's why there are two. But that's the only key. And this is the admin key. And if you have this admin key, you can do everything. You are the master of this container registry. This is primarily for development and testing purposes. It is not the best way to do authentication in the terms of uh, Azure Container Registry. 
For, for our demos here, I enabled the administration key, but for a production environment, it is recommended to not enable the administrative account. Instead, you're going to use so-called service principles. Service principles, in German, Dienstbenutzer, Service principles are uses which are not related to human beings, but a service principle represents an application. Okay? So what you should in reality do is you should create service principles and assign them certain roles. This is a reader, this is a contributor, and whatever. And with that, you can define who is allowed to publish and who is not allowed to publish. Of course, you can also use human accounts, so real user accounts, so I might have the permission to push images, but another application, think of Kubernetes for instance, is not allowed to push images, they are only allowed to pull images in order to spin up new parts. Okay? That's the idea. So, should be done by now. Let's take a look. That's a question of a few seconds, so this, this is pretty easy. As you can see here, this is our Azure Container Registry. Um, we, we see a little bit of statistics here, and by the way, here in the access key area, you can define the admin user, the username, and the passwords. Um, doesn't make sense if you write it down, I will delete this resource group afterwards, after the demo, so yeah, it's just temporary here. But here I can disable the admin user account, and then, and then there is no admin user account. Here we see the repositories. The repositories are essentially then here we will find our Docker um, images, webhooks. Yeah, as I said, these are webhooks. We will see them in a, in a second, and then we have replication. So, for instance, um, if I remember my script correctly, yeah, I created a premium queue. <laughs> see that one? So I used a premium queue, and it's really a nice thing that makes it very clear what it means to have a, a serverless service. So what we see currently here is we are just living in one, in one area, and for instance, if we would like, um, this is currently running in West Europe, meaning Amsterdam, let's think of, we would like to do that in, in America too, just click on it, use the location, hit click, and within, let's say, 30 seconds or a minute, the replication would have been set up and every push that we do would be automatically replicated to, to the US and we don't have to care about it at all. Um, that, that's essentially the, the replication feature. It's trivial. And of course you could automate it with the Azure CLI, but I have, don't have a setup for that. Okay, good. Let's go into the next step. We now created one. Every ACR has an ID. Let me quickly put the ID in a variable. ACR ID. Um, these ACR IDs, let me show you what I mean. If I do that one, you will see that this ACR ID is essentially a namespace, a unique identifier of, ident of identifying this one registry. It has a lot of GUIDs and constants in it. At the end, here, we see the name of our registry, Gather19. That's the name of our registry. So this is just a programmatic ID with which I can uniquely identify a single um, Azure Container Registry. Now, how can I interact with this Azure Container Registry? I could, for instance, do a login. So what I do now here is an AZ ACR login. What happens here? With this line of code, I am accessing my Azure Container Registry as the interactive user Rhinus Robin. So I'm now using my already provided credentials. Can you remember at the very beginning where I entered the device code and where I told you I could use multi-factor authentication and this stuff? Now this is now a secure connection because I have proven with my multi-factor authentication that I am in fact Rhinus Robin and with that line I am connecting my Docker CLI with my container registry and now I can, for instance, push images using a plain Docker push statement but authenticated with multi-factor authentication, maybe also with single sign-on using your Active Directory infrastructure. And that's very important in an enterprise uh, scenario, for instance. Okay? This is interactively working as Rhino Stop. Works perfectly fine for a human being, because I, as a human being, I can use a Chrome browser to enter my credentials. Doesn't work for applications, because, well, they typically don't enter credentials in a web browser. Good. If we want to access our Azure Container Registry, 
not using a human being, but my Azure Container Registry based on, um, on, a, on an application level, I have to create a so-called service principle. And this is the next thing that I do here. Here you see an Azure AD, Active Directory, service principle create for RBAC. RBAC means resource-based access control. Of course, if you are not that much into scripting, what I don't expect on a DevOps conference, but still, maybe you don't feel that com uh, comfortable with, with scripting, uh, what you can also, of course, do is you can go here in the portal, click, uh, go here, and here, I can do exactly the same thing with a nice UI where I can look for the users and I can interactively click things together. That's perfectly fine. It really depends what you want to do. By the way, for those of you who are not that familiar with Azure, you can also do the whole scripting directly in the portal. There is a nice little button up here, this one, that enables you to, to launch shell. So what I essentially get here, if I click on it, is I get a so-called cloud shell, which is under the hoods, kind of Docker container spun up interactively whenever I click on the button, and within a few seconds, I should get my own little shell exactly here and see now I can start hacking around directly in my browser and the nice thing is if you are mainly working that way you can also go directly to shell.azure.com and say hey portal a portal is for kindergartners I am really a DevOps expert I only care for bash so if you click on that one you can forget about the portal at all and you get directly into a bash, or if you prefer that, a PowerShell infrastructure, where you can do essentially the same, the statements look a little bit different. They have also built in a nice little editor, you see that? So if I click on, for instance, one of the files, I can immediately start typing, um, do whatever I want, so I don't need Vim or any other editor, I have that directly in my shell. I really love that, and this shell is also, um, is also responsive and it works pretty nicely on phones and tablets. So if you are on the road and all you have is your iPad Pro and you want to quickly script something, that's exactly the environment you want to go to because you are automatically uh, signed in and, and all the crazy authentication dance is done behind the scenes for you. So that's really convenient. Uh, I have a few uh, colleagues uh, in, in our team in, in Linz who really love that stuff and who spend quite a bit of time here. You can also mount SMB shares into the session so you can store your everyday maintenance scripts in a storage, in an Azure file storage in Azure and then you have it directly here mounted as a folder for instance and you can do Git and, and do source control and all these things directly from here. So this is a nice option if you want to work outside of your, of your own map. Good. But that's just a side topic and I can close it for now um, because yeah, we were here with the SP create for our rec. I just wanted to make it very clear. You don't have to script everything. You can if you want, but you can also do it interactively. So in this case, I'm just creating a user, a service principal with a certain password. Let's do that. Done. And then we get the so-called object ID. In technical terms, it's called app ID uh, for the user. If I say SPA PPID, this is how a user is identified internally. So a service principle, a user that is associated with an app, not with a human being, doesn't have a friendly name. It just isn't good. Okay? So essentially from now on, we can use this, this GUID to, to uh, identify the service principle. And now in the next step, we can assign the service principle, which could also be a human, some permissions on our, um, on our Azure Container Registry. So, good. Uh, I added some additional comments here uh, if you are uh, looking, but the, 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 the uh, resources and the help is, is pretty good here in, uh, in the Azure documentation. So this is now a so-called role assignment. What I'm now doing is, let's take a look here. I am using the GUID of the service principle 
and assign it for our Azure Container Registry ID. You can remember this was the namespace stuff. Slash blah, slash blah, slash blah, gather 19 something. And I give it contributor role. So this service principle can then be used with the ID that I told you before in order to authenticate against this, um, this Azure Container Registry and everything's fine. Please keep in mind for high secure environments that service principles don't absolutely need a secret. If you want to make it even more secure, you can use client certificates. And then, for instance, some internal application that is doing automated management of your infrastructure, of your platform as a service and serverless environments in the cloud, they can use client certificates in order to authenticate against Azure Container Registry. Because the Container Registry has to, has to be protected. Imagine what happens if a hacker could somehow push um, a base in or a, an image with malicious code into your container registry. That would really be not be very good. So this is why you have to think about these things. There is also a third option uh, in Azure, which is called the managed identity. This is a super hot new feature. It's only there. It has only been there for a few months. And managed identity essentially means that Azure maintains the secret for you. So you could, for instance, have a VM in the cloud that is hosting some management portal stuff or it's automated scripts or something like this. And you can tell Azure, this VM is allowed to contribute to this Azure Container Registry. But I don't want to know the secret. Please, Azure, maintain the secret for me and make sure that only programs that run on this VM can access the secret. No human will ever see these credentials. Nobody. And this is, this is exactly what we want. So if you are interested in that feature, please take a look under the, the, the keyword Manage Identity. And you will find a lot of good material in the Azure documentation telling you how you can set this up. At the end of the day, for today's workshop, this is not super relevant, but at the end of, because at the end of the day, it's just a service principle. Okay? Good. So let's give this service principle the role, give it the role assignment. Okay? And let's check whether this really worked. So let's go to our Azure Container Registry, go to Access Control, say View Role Assignments, and then say we only want the, this resource stuff. And you see, this is the service principle. Now this is the descriptive name of the app. In the background it's just the GUID, and this app has contributed permissions. And we can later on, and will later on, set up another service principle, principle which has just read permissions. Good. Questions so far? Good. Now, I can use a Docker login statement and use the service principle that I just created with the regular Docker login. And please, please be aware, this is now no longer Azure. This is plain Docker. And here we really see that the Azure Container Registry is the Docker Registry. It's integrated in Azure, but the users who want to, who want to push some things, some, some images for instance, to the Docker Registry, they don't need to care for Azure. Just give them a service principle and they can do whatever they want. If they have a human ID, they can use the, the Azure login that we have seen before. But this is now no Azure anymore, it's just plain Docker protocol. Good? So let's try it. Good. We are now um, we are now signed in, and now we can try to push something into the Azure Container Registry. Please note that the next two statements are just Docker statements. They have nothing to do, nothing specific with Azure. I'm just tagging the image nginx alpine. Nginx is, for those of you who are not that much into web development, it's a very lightweight web server. Uh, this is now running on Alpine Linux, so this is a web server that consists, uh, that, that is, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 megabytes, something like this, so this, this image is pretty small and we, therefore we don't have to wait a long time. And please note how we access, how we reference our Azure Container Registry. 
we reference it with the name of the container registry, which in our case is just gather19 dot azurecr.io slash and then we specify the repository name and the repository tag. Okay? And this don't need to be that simple. Here you can use a multi-step namespacing concept. So you can structure your containers into, let's say, kind of folder structure uh, just as you like and as it works for you, for your specific needs. So let's try that one. We will tag our Nginx image. So uh, if I say Docker images, then we will see, hope you can read it from the back, that we now have one and the same image, as you can see it here, under two different names. The first name doesn't have any kind of prefix, it just says nginx. The second one says gather19azurecr.io slash nginx. So this one is now, uh, from its name, connected to our container registry and therefore, as soon as we now push this thing, Docker knows that it shouldn't push it to the Docker hub, but it should push it into Azure, into our container registry. And how does it know how to authenticate? Well, within the Docker login, we have exactly the same DNS name up there. So as you can see, this one is the same as this one down there. So Docker is now pushing our image to our Docker container registry. Let's take a look at that. Good. Preparing, pushing, and pushed, and done. That's it. And if we now go to repositories, we have our Nginx web server into our Docker container registry. The point of serverless, I think you can see it here pretty nicely. I've talked a lot about basic concepts, but, but think, don't think of these basic concepts that I just told you. How long did it take us to set up a production level, high scalable Docker container registry in the cloud? I don't know, 30 seconds, something like this, and we're done. There is nothing else to do. You can't harden this stuff for anything. You have access using HTTPS, so the certificates are maintained by Microsoft. We are done. We can store as much data as we want and we pay whatever we really need. Whatever we, re we really need to use. And you have seen the fixed costs per month are extremely low. For the premium edition, 1.5 euro per month. So that's the idea of serverless and serverless registries here in this, in this service. Questions so far? Of course, everybody of you, if you have the credentials, could now do a Docker proof. Well, you can't because you don't have the permissions to do, and that's the whole point I was telling you about security. But you could if you would have the permissions. Good? Nice. Next one. The next sample looks pretty simple, but is pretty powerful. Let me quickly show you what I'm currently in. Um, this scenario is now like this. Uh, let's do it this way. Uh, as you can see here, I have prepared a very small Docker file. Let's cap this Docker file. As you can see, it's just again a web server, and in this case, I'm copying a very simple index.html file. You can see it here into Nginx static web folder. So. If we, if we hit this, this web server with an HTTP GET, it will return the content of the index.html file. So let's cat the index.html file. And here it is, and if everything works nicely, then whenever we hit this container, we should see hello world. Nothing special, yeah, pretty simple. But now I ask you to use your imagination. We now have a Docker file, and we have an index.html, but in real world, this is much more complex. This might be your great Python or Node or C Sharp or whatever application. So you have a pretty complex, maybe multi-step Docker build, Docker file, whatever. It can be as complex as you want. But now you want to build this stuff. And you want to build it whenever it is changed, uh, whenever you, you trigger it explicitly. But you also want to automate building this stuff. For instance, whenever a base image changes, or a GitHub repository changes, you automatically want to build everything. And you want to pay for the CPU milliseconds, as I told you before. And this is essentially this one line of here. 
Let, let's start with version 1, okay? I'm going to do multiple versions here. This is essentially the line that tells the Azure Container Registry to build the image, in this case the, the Docker file, which is in the, in the current folder, and store it in this registry. And now we have multiple, um, multiple uh, good things here. The first one is we don't have to provide the Docker host. The second thing, we don't have to scale. If many people want to build, um, yeah, this is, this is automatically scaled. Next thing, it's secure. Nobody can somehow manipulate the Docker CLI or something. It's provided by Microsoft and they care for the security. And last but not least, we just have to transfer the Docker file plus our DLLs or sources or whatever. We don't have to download the maybe large images. Think of ASP.NET, who maybe, or at least in parts, has to deal with Windows containers, somehow, yeah? at least one. Okay, if you deal with Windows containers, you will see that the Windows Server core image is pretty large. 500 gigs, something in this, something in this space? No, not 500 gigs, 500 megs, sorry. Somewhere in this area. So, yeah, exactly. So if you want to download that just to build the image and you want to upload it again, why downloading it? And that's the whole point here. We just upload the Docker file and it's running in the cloud and they have to provide the big network bandwidth and therefore we say network bandwidth and as we all know, network bandwidth nowadays is often a big problem, especially in the enterprise context because you only have this and that many megabit per second and that's always the fastest one. So, Let's build this stuff. It's pretty simple. Um, let's see. Let's do it like that. Oh, sorry. Here. Um, let's do it like that and go. Now it should start if the internet is still working. Yes. Very good. So what you see here, I will zoom in a little bit. The system is now packing up my sources into a tar file uploading these sources and now doing the login oh it's it's so fast um, i was too slow so we have to uh, walk scroll through it step by step this is the whole build process you see here for maybe one or two seconds it was waiting to get some get some cpu resources from the azure cloud here the azure data center is looking for a free docker host that it could dedicate to this build job and then, yeah, it, it does its job. So as you can see, uh, the, the, the usual export, the usual output from, um, uh, from Docker build statement, it's pulling down the Nginx Alpine stuff, and if you scroll down, we can see um, the, the different steps. And then, and that's the important one, the resulting image is automatically pushed into the container registry, which is responsible for building this image. So this is a one-step process, build and publish. So if everything works nicely, we should, if we refresh here, yes, see our web application that we didn't just upload but build in the cloud. And now we can use it from here. And uh, maybe before the break or after the break, we, can, we will mainly focus on running these containers. Okay? Now we are focusing on building and hosting this stuff. Please interrupt me if you have any questions. Good. This was the building stuff. Of course, you can automatically take a look at the resources. For instance, here you see that currently we have um, a lot of bytes left. If you take a look, and we have 100 webhooks left, and so on. You can do all these things uh, by scripting, but you can also do that um, directly here in the portal. If you want to take a look, you see all these things. That's not very interesting. Good. If we want to delete it again, we can. Any questions regarding the build? Yes, question. Not necessarily the build. Uh, one question regarding the webhooks. This limit of 100, in, um, does that mean configured web webhooks? Or does that mean webhook triggers? So executed webhooks? No, defined webhooks. So you can Ooh. set up up to 100 systems that receive an HTTP post 
whenever something happens in the Azure Container Registry. Something like an image push or delete or something like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. 100. Not executions, but definitions. Mm -hmm. And this 100 webhooks is something that you can, as far as I can remember, you can <coughs> ask support to increase it. Uh, they typically have pretty high limits, 100, you can do a lot of 100 with 100 webhooks, but if you need 5,000 and you have a good reason for that, typically you, you, will, you will get them. But they want to have some kind of throttling in order to, to ensure a kind of fair use policy, but some of these uh, limits can be changed by support. I, I will show you later on how we can create such a trigger, okay? Oh, in fact, we can do that immediately. It fits nicely into the, into the flow here. Um, I have prepared, um, let me quickly, yes, let me quickly deploy that one. I will tell you in a second what this is. And... I also want to show you, where is it, where is it, where is it, here is it, okay. give me a second, okay, this is still running, uh, I don't know if you know this site, it's pretty nice, it's called webhook.site, um, it's, it's a, generically available website out in the internet and you can go to the site, website webhook.site and what you will get is you will get a unique ID where you can send HTTP posts to and you can interactively then inspect if somebody in the big wide internet sent the webhook to this address so it's really nice for testing purposes okay? Is it password protected? Pardon? Is it password no, it is not no, it is not. Don't do that with security relevant data. It's not a good idea. Just for testing purposes. For purposes like that thing that I do. So imagine this webhook now points to your Azure Logic app or your SAP system or your workflow system that you have in your enterprise triggering some fancy workflows or SharePoint workflows or whatever. In our case, it's just a website gathering HTTP posts. Okay? This is the first thing that I published. And the second thing that I am now publishing is a nice little sample application. You can look it up in my material. It is, it is, it is exactly here. Here you see the GitHub sample. Uh, Azure Samples Azure Event Reviewer. This is a, a sample for a web application, a single page app that can receive webhooks and display them on a nice web page. So if you somehow would like to build such a functionality into your, let's say, support portal or whatever, take a look at that sample and I'm currently deploying it to Azure so that we have this sample, okay? This is what we are, what I am now doing. And it's already done. Should now be here. If we take a look, refresh it, here it is. This is the deployed application. Of course, I am not using infrastructure as a service, but this is already hosted. By, uh, by a platform as a service. service. It's the Azure Event Grid Reviewer. Good. So, I will tell you a little bit more about what I'm doing now. And now, in a minute, currently just trust me. <laughs> and we will set up now the weapon. This is the thing where I would like to talk a little bit about it and then we are going to try it. So, good. This is how you set up a webhook. You tell the system, hey, if something in this registry is going on, then please send an HTTP post to this URL. And this URL is now pointing to the website that I showed you a second ago. Okay? So if everything works out nicely, and I now build version 2 of our great web application showing how the world, we should see something. Let's scroll up. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, here. 
That's build B2. Go for it. So, build is running, build is running. You know what? Let's do it immediately here and here and wait for it. Uh, on the left hand side, you see waiting for first request. It took, what did it take? 5 seconds, 10 seconds, I don't know. Let's be patient and here it is. See? This is the web hook. If we click on it and we take a look, then we will somewhere see somebody pushed an image to our container registry. Where did it um, push it to? It pushed it to the repository, hello world, and the tag was v2. So what could you, for instance, do with this information? You could now set up in Azure a container, uh, so-called uh, Azure Automation Runbook, for instance, which is uh, a possibility to schedule, for instance, PowerShell to do automatic infrastructure maintenance. So whenever somebody pushes a new version of your great uh, internet shop, the previous version was v4 and now a new image was pushed, it's called v5, you could automatically do some deployment stuff. You could deploy a new test environment or production environment or you could dynamically set up some traffic shaping where you deploy the new version and, and um, send 20% of the sessions to the new version and do some monitoring stuff and do some green boot deployment and, or canary releases or things like that. You know what I mean? This is the purpose of webhooks. This is why webhooks are there. Questions? Clear? In our case, we were just interested in push. Of course, we could also register to delete and everything. Yeah, we can try that. That's one possibility. And by the way, see that one? Our nice website. This is the sample from Microsoft. We are not going to take a look at the web development code because this is not a, um, uh, a development session here. But here we see that this website also received this, this, this push and here we can also take a look at the JSON. We see the time and again we see the subject and so on and so on. I don't have to read it for you, you can read it yourself. The big difference between this solution and the webhook solution, and this is the last thing that I'm um, to, uh, talking about this integration piece here, is that here the Azure Container Registry is using a service in Azure which is called Event Grid. And we have to spend uh, a little bit of time talking about this, uh, this event grid. Event grid is an integration mechanism built into Azure. It's essentially a kind of, um, not service, yeah, it's a kind of service bus, but more event oriented, with which Azure services, like for instance Container Registry, but many other Azure services too, inform other services in technical terms, it's called microservices, that something interesting has happened. And the big difference between a webhook and the event grid here is that the event grid has been built for reliability. So it also caches the, 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 the events. So if the target system is currently down and will be up in 15 seconds again, it will nevertheless receive the event and things like that. So if you build more complex DevOps workflows for your, for your infrastructure, based on Azure Container Registry or whatever, you should prefer Event Grid over, um, over webhooks because that is the more modern way of doing integrations. And what I wanted to show you is that the Azure Container Registry supports both things. It supports messaging via Event Grid and it supports webhooks via HTTP requests. Get the idea? Okay? Good. Good, good. These integration technologies are super important in Azure. Now, the first thing that I don't do scripted, uh, because it's easier to show it uh, like that, especially in conjunction with uh, serverless services like Logic Apps. Who has not heard about Logic Apps before? Okay. Who is using Office 365, by the way? 
Okay, much better. Now, maybe you've heard about Flow. This if this then that from Microsoft. Um, yeah, Flow is a simplified version of Logic Apps. Logic Apps is essentially a workflow engine built into Azure serverless. So you don't deploy servers, you don't deploy the engine, you don't care about the operating system at all, you're just describing a workflow, and these workflows can be triggered from the Azure Container Registry. Let me show you. Um, DevOps Gathering. We will put it again into our DevOps Gathering here, West Europe, and go for it. Deployment takes only a few seconds. Good, here we are. This is the link that I wanted to point out. These workflows, and I'm going to show you in a second what these workflows can do, don't worry, we will not do a deep dive into Logic App. This is not a Logic App session. But I think it's important to connect the dots between different services in order to understand what you can do with that. Now, as you can see, these Logic Apps can be triggered with HTTP requests, think of webhooks, and they can be triggered with event grids, think of the website sample that I showed you before. So both integrations are possible. Let's do the simple thing. Let's go for HTTP request is received. Blah, blah. And the power of this, um, of this Logic Apps is that Logic Apps supports a lot of pre-built actions. Want to do something in, I don't know, dynamic CRM or send an email using SendGrid or, or Mailgun or whatever? Do you want to trigger something in a SharePoint list or do you want to add an, an appointment to Outlook or do you want to automatically trigger a runbook that runs a PowerShell uh, responding to a change in your container registry? That is exactly what this stuff is for. And this is a powerful workflow engine. Don't think of business process, whatever stuff. This is for us techies. This is for technologies, the technologists. And Microsoft has spent a lot of time carefully working on that so that we can use it in DevOps to automate DevOps processes. And I think this is in an enterprise context really important because for us as DevOps people, the story only begins when our developers push their images into some kind of registry. Because our entire systems consist of many, many different containers in a world of microservices. We have, to, we have to do a lot of things. So we have to orchestrate these processes. We have to react on changes in the images. And this is exactly one of the tools that we can use for that, using the webhook integration or the event grid integration. Is it clear what I wanted to say? Yeah? Good. And again, you pay per workflow execution. You never see any kind of server, you don't specify a size, CPU, memory, or whatever. You pay for the number of executions. Good. So this was a short step out of Docker land into integration land. But yeah, we are not living on an island, so we have to talk about it a little bit. So if I go down here again, just to show you where you have to look it up in the, uh, in the script. Here is a section which is called integration. This one deploys the web application. It has nothing to do with Docker, so I'm go not going to talk about it a lot. This one registers event grid. This one sets up the event grid subscription, meaning, hey, tell me if something happens via event grid. And this one sets up uh, a web application. Now, does this work, does this also work um, for 
for instance, the other way around. If we don't want to get notified if something changes, but we would like to consume web news. Think of the following. Your developers, they store their Node.js Docker files and code in a GitHub repository. So whenever something changes in the GitHub repository, and this is just an example, you can, in your mind, you can also say, I, I don't use GitHub, I use a base image in the Docker Hub, for instance. Can we consume such a webhook? And yes, we can. And we can do that with so-called Azure Container Registry tasks. We can set up tasks, and these tasks then listen to incoming information, to incoming events, for instance, webhooks. And for this workshop, I thought it would be nice to set up a webhook that is reacting on a chain in GitHub. Okay? So, I created a small GitHub, um, small GitHub repository, it's that one. It's just for this workshop and it is not very complex. It contains a good old friend, our Docker file with the Nginx web server. And it contains the content of our direct application. This time it says Hello DevOps Gathering. And our idea is we would like to, to run a build of our, um, of our container whenever something changes in the, in the GitHub. Okay? Just as an example. So let's try that. Here. Wait a minute. Here we go. So what I essentially do here is I am creating a task, as you can see here. I am listening to change, uh, sorry, I'm listening to changes in a certain GitHub repository, that's that one. I monitor a special file, the Docker file. I monitor the master branch, and I would like to do something in our registry. That is essentially what I do. So, let's set up this task. So now it's creating the task. Okay, task is created. If we say, show me a list of tasks, I have some tasks which I used previously in order to, uh, when I prepared this session, so forget about these two. The point is, if I now go to GitHub, here it is, and let's edit something. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong browser. Security is so inconvenient. However, we have to do it. So, let's go here and edit this file and say hello DevOps gathering in Bochum, for instance. And then save the changes and do a commit to GitHub. Nothing more. I didn't do anything else. And now if we go back to our script and run the list of tasks again, then you see that it automatically recognized a change in GitHub and started to build an image in our container registry and it will publish the resulting build in our container registry. This could, for instance, be the development build. At the end of this development build, we have the new, the latest tag in our Azure Container Registry. And with via well, webhook or event grid, we could start a workflow where we can send the product on an email and say, hey, a new version is available. Do you want to deploy it to test? Yes. And then we can trigger the next step, the next step, the next step. I think you get the point, right? So let's see if it works. And if you see, yep, yeah, we are done. It took us 19 seconds, and the trigger was in that case a good Do we have to pay for the number of images? Pardon? Do we have to pay for the number of images that we keep on creating? Not the people? number, but the size. Uh, if you took a look at the pricing page, you see that you have to pay a basic fee for each container registry, just a few euros per month. Can it be rolled back or rolled over? Like pen bills could be the max that can get in and it just gets rolled over. Uh, no, you, if you do building, you have to build for the CPU seconds, but not for the number of builds, only for the amount of time. In this case, the 90 seconds. So um, in this case, 19 seconds. So I can go here to our pricing and then you can multiply this very little number with 19 and then you know what this build it didn't cost us.
in that case, it's a trivial application, therefore it's only 19 seconds. Of course, in real life, such a build might take a few minutes, something like this, and then you can exactly calculate how much it costs. So sometimes, you know, if you have like a powerful system, it takes less amount of time to build it. So do we define that here or? I don't get the question. You have a powerful system. So if, like, let's say if you have a powerful CPU mm -hmm. with more RAM or something. Ah, okay. Um, you cannot ask for specific machines in ACR. You get what they offer. You can take a look in the documentation where they specify what you can get. If you need specific machines for building, then this is not an option. That's generally the case, you see. Um, many people, when they take a look at the serverless and platform as a service offerings from Microsoft, they say, okay, that's nice, but I have specific needs and therefore this doesn't fit, fit exactly to my needs. Then, unfortunately, you cannot use these offerings. To make it very clear, this is an, this is an, an offering that was tailored for the typical business application. For the typical microservice that you build in an enterprise or SaaS scenario. This is not something special. This is not the Ferrari, that's the Volkswagen Golf. Okay? And this is what Microsoft does. They are using commodity, they are, they are building serverless and platform as a service offerings for commodity things, for things many people need, not for the edge cases. Do they support iOS? It is in this no. Um, service? No. No, they don't. they don't. They have other options. If you want to build iOS, for instance, then you can use for Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps, it's the, the build and CI CD pipeline built uh, combined with uh, Azure pipelines, for instance. There, they have ready made images and ready made build servers, which can build iOS applications and Android applications. But that has nothing to do with this kind. Because, I, I, to be honest, ah, now I think where you are coming from. This is to build a Docker image. Why would you build a Docker image for iOS? I think you no, 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 not about that. I'm just asking a question. Does it? Ah, for now I get it. You want to use this feature to build an iOS app that is then published to some kind of app store? No, this scenario is definitely not uh, intended to be used here. This is what Azure DevOps has been built for. Okay. I didn't fully understand your question in, in the first one. I'm sorry, but now I think I got it. Okay. I think this is now the correct answer. Good. So now we have both sides. We have outgoing webhooks, incoming webhooks, both in a second. Good. We have approximately 10 minutes left and now we have created so many images, but we haven't run a single container. And I think we should at least start with running such a container um, in the first service that I would like to talk about. Um, the next thing that I would like to show you um, is a service which is called ACI, Azure Container Instances. And this is a, this is a, a hmm, serverless pass, a little bit of both, um, a serverless service to run containers. It's the simplest way to run a generically usable container in Azure. Now, listen closely, because this is the only, this is the most important thing to take away here. Azure Container Registry is a generically usable container engine. You don't need to run a web application there. There are specific services for web applications. You can run anything in that area. You can run a, a container without any kind of incoming web traffic. It could be some number crunches doing some report generation or whatever. You can run whatever you want, but these Azure Container Instances are not thought for long-running containers. They are thought for containers that you spin up, they run seconds, minutes, hours, and then they are gone again. They would be too expensive to run a web server 24-7 for many, many months. There are other services for that. If you would like to run the dockerized version of any kind of database, don't use Azure Container Instances. The idea of Azure Container Instances is a kind of scale-out mechanism. Make it super simple to provide an image, spin up a container, do something, terminate it, and pay for the number of milliseconds that it ran. That's the whole idea. 
Okay? So if you think, it, I, as, as I told you, I do a lot of development stuff. So as a software engineer, this opens a whole new universe of possibilities. Because now I could, for instance, do some data import tasks or an Excel export or generating some reports or PDFs or whatever. I don't need to run them in my own process space. I don't need to run them somehow in a, in a forked child process anywhere. I can delegate these things to short running containers and these things will not eat away my CPU. This stuff scales endlessly. If many people click on the button, do the data export, Microsoft has to deal with a lot of ACI instances. When my data import is gone, let's say after five minutes, maybe it takes five minutes, then the container instance is terminated automatically. I don't have to care for it. And I pay, just like with serverless, for the number of CPU milliseconds in memory. And in this case, I can now tailor the size to what I really need. I, have, I can tell the system how many CPUs do I want and how much memory do I want. Okay? So, again, let's take a look at the price because I know price matter. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong one. Um, here. Yeah. Instances. So, <clears throat> That's essentially it. Memory, gigabyte seconds, so the number of gigabytes multiplied by the number of seconds that your containers ran multiplied by this very low number, and CPU number of CPU seconds, virtual CPU seconds multiplied by that number. One of the first things that people, when I do these workshops, always ask me is they say, hey, if I take a look at that one, I cannot use this stuff. Because my bosses ask me how much will this system cost. I have no idea how many gigabyte seconds and CPU seconds I really use. You are right. The only way to calculate the costs for a service, a service like that is by trying it. I'm very sorry. If you would tell me exactly how many vCPU seconds you need and how many gigabyte seconds you need, I can tell you exactly how much money it will cost you. But up front, you typically don't know how much power you need. And therefore, you have to try it. The point is, if you make your software more efficient, you pay less. If your software needs more power or is less efficient, you pay more money. It's just like electricity. Today, I could come take my laptop, I could come to this place, I can plug it in, and I get enough power, and somebody out there in the network has to deal with providing me with the necessary power. And that's exactly how serverless works. Okay? Good. So, let's take a look how this works. Um, the first thing is something that I would like to cover um, in after the break. Just trust me that it makes sense what I do here. And after the break, I'll tell you more. It only takes a few seconds. Remember the term key vault. Sounds like security, right? Yeah, it has to do with security. Very important concept when it comes to Azure. And we'll talk about it after the break. if everything goes nicely and smooth. Yes, here is all right the key wall, so it should be done in a second. Good. We'll do that one. And this is oops, secret not found. Why secret not found? Um, let me quickly check that. That worked. I see. Okay. Sec give me a second. I did something wrong. Um, I. I ran that script B 
before we started this workshop, And therefore, the name was already taken. Give me a second. I'm sorry for that. I just forgot to delete one thing. Good. So let's quickly analyze what I did here. Forget the keyboard stuff, I will tell you later on. <laughs> Add a container create, that's the statement with which I started it, and this is the only thing that we have to specify. How many virtual CPUs, how many gigabytes of memory. The borders in which you can ask for resources are defined in the documentation. I don't know by heart how many CPUs and how many gigabytes you can ask for. I don't know that by heart, so please look it up in the documentation. Just Google for AZ container create and you will get the information. But that's the point, okay? This is what you should keep in mind. Azure Container Instance is, you have a registry somewhere in the internet, typically an Azure Container Registry, and then you just say, this image this number of CPUs, this number of gigabytes, go. And that's it. Nothing complex. Does it make sense to run a database here? No. This is optimized for stateless services. If you need to store state somewhere, please store it externally. Microsoft offers you ready-made platform as a service offerings for MongoDB, for MySQL, for MariaDB, for SQL Server, for whatever you want, store your data there, not in the Azure Container Instances. Azure Container Instances is this image, these resources, go. And if it takes 10 seconds, and after 10 seconds it's gone again, that's fine. If it takes a day, after a day it's gone again, that's fine. But that's how this thing should be used. Good, now we are done. And if everything works out nicely, then we have, see it here, gather 19 web. This is now our container instance. If you watch closely, you have seen that for this specific container, I would like to have a public IP address and I would like to open a certain port. Certain port. That's not absolutely necessary. If I don't need incoming web requests, I can leave that out. I don't need it. But in this case, I specify it. So, if we go here, we can copy the IP address here. And if everything works nicely, we see hello world, and this is exactly what we want. If we don't need it anymore, we can go here and just say stop or delete, and that's done. And then it's gone. <coughs> this supports Windows and Linux. So you can run the Windows container in the same way as a Linux container. Of course, the Windows container will use more resources. That's the point. That's the We can also take a look at the logs. Let's do that one. Now we connect it to, let's say, standard out of the container. So if I go here and open that one, you will see that, yeah, here you see it. See it? So this was, um, this is the fab icon and somewhere up here we also have the other request. So this is how you can connect to this stuff and programmatically deleting the container as a piece of cake, you just say AC container delete and it's gone. Good. You can also automatically terminate the Azure Container instance as soon as the job that is running inside of the container finishes. It depends. You can specify whether it should restart automatically or whether it should, should uh, do Harakiri whenever it uh, has done its job. Okay? So what have we learned in the first one and a half hours? We have learned what is the Azure Container Registry. You have seen how we set it up, how we secure it, how we can push images to it, how we can use it to automate image building, 
how we can integrate it in workflows using outgoing and incoming webhooks. The thing that we published, the, the image that we published in the Azure Container Registry, we then learned what Azure Container Instances are, a generically usable service for running simple containers or groups of containers, kind of pods, without having to care for complex things like Kubernetes and so on. We pointed to the Azure Container Registry and said, run, and it ran, and we have to pay for it, exactly for the resources that we use. This was the content of the first one and a half hours, and it's now time for a break. After the break, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into Azure Container Instances. I'm going to show you what's possible there, and we will talk about how we can secure Azure Container Registry using Key Vault. And then, we have two services left that I'm going to talk, tell you about in this workshop. We are going to take a look at Azure App Services for running web APIs and web services and microservices based on Windows and Linux containers. And last but not least, we will set up a brand new, our own brand new managed Kubernetes cluster and do some deployments there and see how this Kubernetes cluster can be run in a serverless uh, and platform as a service way. Okay? So, enjoy the break. It's now 3 p.m. We will continue at 3.30. Good. See you later.